The Voices of Kentucky Anna, hosted by Debbie Crawford. Music by Clay Beverly. Produced by Lynn King. Hi, my name is Lenora Rogers, and I am a writer for PS Publishing. And I am going to read to you today from the latest book, Zeke and Zach Fumble Through a Fairy Long Lesson. And this book is part of a series, and it's about the two helpers to the tooth fairy. And they're not very smart, and they mess up a lot. And she uh, has to rescue them quite often from their adventures. So what I'm going to do today is just read a short section. It's a chapter book. Uh, and uh, then talk about the book later. Uh, where we pick up the story, they are getting ready to go to yet another house. They've been on the job for a week, and it's not working out very well. And so they're checking their supplies one last time. So the boys recheck their supplies one last time. Zeke examines his white satin bag inside and out. It is now bulging with baby teeth and beginning to get heavy. He tries not to let Zach hear him groan when lifting it. Zack checks his pockets. He has plenty of quarters and dollar bills left. If a child wants any more than that, he thinks the parents will just have to chip in. He pops the top on his ever-present soft drink and sticks it in his pocket for a sip later while they're working. There's no time for breaks on this job. The two helpers arrive at the next house a few minutes ahead of the boss, as expected. They hover over the child's bed feeling proud of themselves for being early. When Zack looks down, he nearly chokes on his chewing gum. Squirt a turd! What the heck is that creature? Shh, it's okay, whispers Zeke. That's just a basset hound. They're supposed to be sweet dogs. Just don't wake him up and don't get so close. Hounds have powerful noses. Marshall, the 65-pound lemon and white basset hound in question, lay on his belly across the foot of the child's bed. His bucket-sized head hung off one side, his long tail off the other. Drool drips out of his mouth, pooling on the floor below. He's in a deep, blissful, doggy dream sleep. All four paws wiggle as he chases butterflies in a field of clover. I like it when they land on my nose, Marshall dreams. Come here, butterflies. He gallops after them. There seem to be so many today, blue ones and brown ones and yellow ones. The child, who everyone calls Stephen, runs just ahead of him, laughing and swinging a small net. He is Marshall's height and has a head full of blonde hair and large blue eyes with long lashes. Marshall likes Stephen. He rubs Marshall's belly a lot and rides around on his back yelling, Horsey! Suddenly the field of clover disappears and becomes something else. Marshall is suddenly standing on a raised platform in the middle of a big round arena with the woman who everyone calls Mom. He's being held on a thin black leash. A strange man Marshall doesn't recognize is giving Mom a big blue ribbon that says, best in show, and people are taking pictures of him and patting his head and smiling. Where did the butterflies go, he wonders. Then, chapter two, Chasing Bugs. Sniff, Marshall awakes and his humongous hound dog nose twitches. Sniff, sniff. He opens his eyes and looks around. He doesn't recognize this smell. Sniff, sniff, sniff. He looks up and sees a small bright light hovering in the air just over the foot of the bed. As he raises his head, the light begins to move away and separates into two lights. <gasps> Fireflies, Marshall thinks. He scrambles to get his girth off the bed. He claws at the bedspread and bounds onto the floor. <gasps> go, 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 screams Zeke. He thinks we're bugs. The two little fairies take off. Zack hits his left wing on the wall as they round the door and fly into the hallway. Ow! Hey, how do you know what he's thinking? Are you a mind reader? How's come I can't do that? I'll explain later. Quit your whining and punch it! Zeke screams again. They fly down the hallway with Marshall in slow but hot pursuit, barking all the way, slobber slinging. Look! Stairs, stairs! Go down, go down! They make a quick right turn and take a set of stairs that lead down. They have no idea where they're going. For all they know, there could be other wild animals living in this house. Marshall can't quite make the sharp turn. As he flails around trying to get his footing on the slick hardwood floor, his paws go out from under him and BAM! 
He lands on his right side and yelps. Boy, these fireflies are fast. He fights for traction and finally his paw pads stick to the floor. He hits the stairs two at a time. He knows these stairs by heart. He's chased tennis balls thrown down by Stephen many times. But this time in his haste, he steps on one huge floppy brown ear and tumbles down the last four steps. Zeke and Zach make it down to the far reaches of the basement with their fairy wings backed up against a wall. Out of breath and panicking, they're holding on to each other when suddenly they hear a yelp and a loud thump, thump, thump sound coming from the stairs. They look over and see the huge basset tumbling head over tail on his way down. When he hits the floor at the bottom, all is quiet for a second. They see him slowly get up and shake his head. Slobbers fly straight out on both sides and stick to the walls. After Marshall shakes the stars out of his eyes, he trots over to just beneath the two small lights glowing in the dark high up on the wall. He sits down hard on his bottom to have a closer look. Sniff? No, nope, not butterflies, Marshall decides. Sniff, sniff? Rawhide bones? Sniff, sniff, sniff? No, nope, not rawhide bones. The smell's not right. He sees wings. Butterflies! Marshall stands up dances back and forth and begins wagging his tail waiting for the butterflies to come down and play but they stay up in the air and won't budge so he barks in his deep baritone again woof 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 the sound is deafening to the two little apprentices they tremble and hold on to each other why doesn't that child come and get this creature fairy apprentices don't get hazard pay you know I guess coming down here is one of those ways we cause our own problems Zeke announced he's got us trapped all right, that does it. I've had enough. Zack grabs a handful of money out of his pockets and starts to throw it down to the floor. No one told us this job was survival of the fittest. I quit. Are you kidding me? Zeke yelled over the dogs barking. He held his hands over his pointy fairy ears while trying to comfort his friend. Have you forgotten? No one else would hire us because we're such losers. We quit every job we're given. We don't like the climate. We don't like the hours. We don't like the uniform. We don't like to work. You name it, we don't like it. We've got to grow up, dude. This is our last chance. Remember what the boss said when she hired us? She's giving us one month. If we can't hack it, then we're out. And I don't know about you, but I just made a down payment on a 60-inch flat screen TV, and I'm not giving that baby up. Zeke knows they're not where they're supposed to be, which is waiting for the boss in the child's room. He's determined not to let her down again. He leans over to Zack and whispers in his ear, When I say go, fly like your life depends on it, as fast as you can, back to the child's room. What? Zack pants. That's crazy. This creature will catch us. Just do what I say, Zeke repeats. Go. Zack had never flown so fast. It really wasn't recommended. Their fairy wings are very thin and delicate. As he reaches the stairs, he flings the money he pulled from his pocket in Marshall's direction and pumps his legs, moving his high top shoed feet in the air, just in case that helped. The two fairies can hear Marshall trying to climb back up the stairs. He's huffing and puffing and moving much slower, coming back up than going down. However, he manages to jump the last two steps at once. When he's within chomping distance, Marshall opens his mouth to get a taste of one of the butterflies. Just as he manages to stick out his tongue to lick one of Zeke's wings, Zack kicks him in the nose with one of his high top sneakers and jerks Zeke out of the way to safety. The kick doesn't feel like a kick to Marshall. It feels like a tickle on his snout. The tickle makes his nose twitch and wiggle, wiggle and twitch. He can't hold it back any longer. Suddenly, he lets go with a volcanic sneeze. Snot and slobbers go flying out of his face and hit Zeke and Zack full force. As the two go tumbling through the air from the force of the blast, dripping from head to toe with goo, they realize they're back in the child's room. At that very instant, they feel the air vibrate and shimmer. Suddenly, poof, there she is. And I'm just going to leave you hanging right there and you'll just have to get the book. Right now it's available as an ebook from uh, on Amazon and you can get the print book from PS Publishing's website and all of the books from PS Publishing have a message uh, 
this one is responsibility. The two guys have to learn. They have to do what they're told to do without someone watching them. So I hope you enjoy Zeke and Zach fumble through a very long lesson. Lenora, we are so glad you're here. And you are here at Karen's Book Barn with several other authors today. You have written several children's books. How many have you written all together? I have five of my own, counting uh, the new book from PS Publishing. And then I also write with another group of authors from all over the world, and we call ourselves the Peacock Writers. Oh, my goodness. And we get together once a year online, and uh, all of our books uh, are go for children's charities and it's a just combination of children's poetry and short stories and so forth and we come up with a theme every year and uh, so I write with them as well. So you write with the Peacock Group and, and that's for charity. The books that you write are sold and that money is given to different mm -hmm. charities. Mm -hmm. We can buy those oh. books uh, and then sell them locally right. and then we can give the money to any local organization that benefits children. Oh wow, so if, if you're wanting to help support a local charity and buy a book for your child or grandchild, well this is the perfect thing right here. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm wondering what inspired you to become an author? Why did you start writing? Was there an event or a... I have always written, uh, probably since fourth or fifth grade, and I just never did anything with my writing. I would just write, you know, little space stories, kind of like Star Wars things, and then just throw it away. I didn't show it to anyone. Oh, no. And uh, so then, you know, life intervened, and I grew mm -hmm. up, got married, had children, and uh, after I retired from federal government, I went to work as an instructional assistant in elementary school and did that for 13 years and began to see what children enjoy uh, reading and uh, where there's a need for more genres. And so that kind of inspired me to grab out the old notebooks and start writing again. And so for about five years now, I have been writing children's books. And then I had to decide, what did I want to do with all of this? I, <laughs> I had a pile of stories and things yes. and ideas. And did I want to just keep it and show it to family? Or did I want to publish it and let other children read it? And I decided to go into you know, exploring publishing. I'm glad you did. Uh, your books are very colorful. And they all have a, a base story to them, a base Thank you, thank you. The the series of books with P.S. Publishing out of uh, South Dakota right. um, is about uh, character building books, and we try to put free books into the child ch children's hands. It, yes. And so that program is sponsored by United Way and other local businesses, and so they pay for advertising in the book, and then we go into the schools and read, and then that pays for the book, and every child. It's a free it's book. A book. Mm -hmm. And some children don't ever see a book unless that happens. That's right. That's right. So you don't have to worry about some children ordered a book and they got it and others couldn't afford to order a book. Everybody gets a book. And so uh, I've been writing with them for about a year now. And there are authors with PS Publishing all over the country. And so uh, our publisher goes into a school and then we live Skype if we're not close by. And, uh, and then she has our books and gives them out. Now, when the schools are wanting you to come and do this, how, how would someone contact you in order to have you come in and read a book and all the students in the school get that book? There is what a website, PS Publishing, or it's actually publishps.com, and there is a page on there where you can apply to have your school get free books. And if uh, it, she'll just pick one of us authors that are in that area, and we will travel there. Oh, yes. Yeah do a live Skype and whoever is there will That's live wonderful. Skype with the rest of the authors in right. there. And so, you know, she's uh, she's really set this up well. Colleen Leibsch, the publisher. Mm -hmm. So, very proud. And this is the first book I've written. It's aimed at fourth and fifth grade. And the other authors write uh, for different grades. Different age and Different age groups. Mm -hmm. Well, this is wonderful because I know a lot of schools don't know that you all do this. Right. Right. So we're going to we're going to make sure you know now. <laughs> We're going to get this out to you. So if you want to contact her, we have the information here. So you'll give her a call and check out the website and see if she'll come into your school and read a book or some of the other authors maybe? Yes, absolutely. We'd love it. Now how often do you get to come and see Karen's Book Barn? 
this is my first time. This is your and first I time? I love this bookstore. Yes. I love it. Just a local bookstore, and it goes on and on and on for aisles <laughs> and, and just all kinds of neat little places. Right. Yeah, we're loving it here today. It's wonderful here. And you are from where? E-Town. Oh, that's not town. too far. Oh, no, no. no just not too far at all. An hour and yeah. a half away or so, yeah. So I'm loving it and looking forward to the big author's fair at the end of the month, too. Yes, that's going to be just wonderful. That'll be a, an amazing event, as always. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for well, making us feel so special. Oh, We're having a great day. <laughs> you are special. I mean, you're doing some great things. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Nelda Copas, and I'm the author of several, well, three, I shouldn't say several, murder mysteries or suspense novels. It's Twisted Desires, Twisted Revenge, and Twisted Obsession. And I'm also working on another one that's Twisted Darkness. So, um, it's a female protagonist who is a real strong detective. She's a strong female, but she has um, flaws. She's not perfect. So, um, Basically, she's after a serial killer in a town that's named Brenton, but it's based on Bowling Green, Kentucky. And the second book is also in Brenton, and the third is in Radcliffe, because that's where I'm from now. So I'm going to read a little bit that I can read <laughs> from the book, and it's about a crime scene when Detective McKay has just arrived with her partner, um, Detective Phelps. She stepped into the bedroom and stopped. Ash and his partner Chuck Brown, a nice guy in his early 40s, stood watching a member of the CSU take photographs of the body. McKay moved around them to get a clear view of the bed as the CSU guy moved around the bedroom. Ash and Brown turned to see McKay. Ash turned back to the body, but Brown thanked her for coming. Hello, McKay. Come on up and get a good look, Ash said. McKay knew that Ash was watching her as she approached the bed, and she, the moment she glimpsed the body, she understood why. It took every ounce of self-control she could muster to let Ash, not let Ash know she had seen this before and that it terrified her. The woman on the bed was naked and a pasty blue color. She lay in the center of the bed that had been stripped except for a bottom sheet. A pillow had been placed beneath her head and she had been positioned as if on a cross with her arms out to the sides. Her wrist and ankles were discolored where ligatures had been and on her neck was a broader single furrow with deep puncture wounds evenly spaced where what appeared to have been barbed wire had been placed. Her eyelids were closed. Her red hair seemed to have been brushed and spread out like a fan on the pillow. The woman's beaten face was devoid of any makeup. Who is the victim, McKay asked? Leslie Brett Ferris. She's a computer analyst for NetVision. The office is uptown in Thoroughbred Square. According to her driver's license, she's 31 years old. McKay's partner, Phelps, pushed aside Ash as if he weren't there. She's been beaten pretty badly. This one looks worse than the other victim. Just looking, I'd say there were more than a few loose teeth and a broken nose. McKay nodded. More bite marks, and they were more violent. McKay had already noted the bite marks. Although the press presence of teeth marks on a victim's flesh is common in sex crimes. It's, it bothered her. It was so animalistic, so primal. She leaned in closer. Yeah, there are more bite marks, and these are definitely more severe, more vicious. McKay bent down next to Phelps and studied what he was looking at. A shiver spread through her body as she drew in a gasp. Brown looked close. What the hell? <laughs> McKay didn't want to believe what she was seeing. She felt dizzy. Phelps had lifted the woman's eyelids and where the orbs should have been were deep dark holes. She had no eyes. Nelda, it's so good to have you here with us today. You have written some books that are much different than the other ladies we've spoken to, but I find them intriguing. Okay. Because they are what? They are what? They're thrillers. They're, they're sus thrillers. Yes, they're suspenseful. So. And so you actually write stories about detectives and murder mystery? Right. I um, have worked in those areas with law enforcement right. um, for a rape crisis center. I was the victim advocate. I have worked in drug court. I've worked a lot where I've had to go with detectives on cases to, right. to help victims. Yes. So it's just 
the way I lean. It's just what I'm interested in. And you have a background for it, so you have the insight as to what happens, and it's more realistic. Right. So you're not uh, reading a story that maybe the crime scene was, the evidence was collected in a certain way that's not real. You're going to be getting a real insight as to what happens on a crime scene with this. Right. I've had um, friends that have read the book that are police officers, and they say it's very realistic. It's true to form. Yes, yes. I have to condense down the time frame of well, how of things happen. Yeah. But I also have a master's in mental health counseling, so that helps me with your with uh, my diagnosis <laughs> of my characters in the book I was also a nurse in the army so I used my medical and my psychological training to write the books oh my goodness I want to know what inspired you to start writing this was it all the jobs that you've had that you just talked about or was it something else? well I wrote when I was a kid but I quit for a long time and I was in college and I was taking things like um, deviant behavior or abnormal psychology <laughs> And I just found that I was always interested in watching the news, and if there was a case about a serial killer somewhere, oh, I'm you were on, on it. <laughs> I <laughs> am on it. So I would just, it's just things that interest me, and right. I want to know why. Why they do what they do. I think it's great. I'm going to tell you, that if you like murder mystery novels, this is this is going to keep you on the edge of your seat. So It will keep you awake. It, <laughs> it might keep you awake a couple of nights in a row. <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but Karen's Book Barn every Saturday has a group of authors that come in. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's four or five. If you like authors and you want to meet some of them, or murder mysteries all the way down to children's books, I think you would enjoy this visit. So see if you can find Karen's Book Barn in LaGrange, Kentucky, right beside the railroad tracks. Have a book, get a book, go outside, sit by the railroad tracks, and read a story and enjoy the evening. This is a great place to visit.